greatness is measured many ways. But when it is measured with the weight of over 70 years of grand history behind it, then distinction becomes its very soul. The Orange Bowl was not built with greatness in mind, but over time its place in history made it so. If this building could talk, what would it say? What stories would it share and where would it begin? We're 6-0 and against bowl teams and we're national champions. Miami was a struggling young city back in the late 1920s and early 30s during the Great Depression. Early Miamians knew exactly what their fledging city had to offer. They just needed a plan to bring people's hearts, minds, and wallets to their cash-strapped city. The history of the kind of football games we're talking about, really they go back to 1926. A lot of people don't know this. It's called the Fiesta of the American Tropics, and George Merrick had it at his stadium uh, in Coral Gables. Then the idea kind of faded, and, and in the uh, 30s, trying to extend the uh, season, they started the Palm Festival, and uh, this was 1933, and they played at Moore Park, which is a city park, you know, up on 36th Street. And they did it again in 34, but they were getting, starting to grow more people, and uh, so they were trying to decide they needed to build a stadium, where to put it. And the baseball stadium was at the site of the current Orange Bowl. And so they decided this was a big hunk of land and there already was a sports stadium there. So uh, they used the bleachers from the uh, American Legion Parade and built the first stadium, so to speak, really just a bunch of bleachers at that site and then began to lobby toward getting a permanent facility. And uh, they finally, with the WPA, the Works Progress Administration during the New Deal, uh, the power that be were able to go to Washington and lobby their case, just like they do today. And the WPA built the first real stadium that Miami ever had, which is the one that was enlarged. Uh, and until we got to, I think, in, by the 80s, it was holding more than 70,000 people. And I think the first Palm Festival had 1,500, so uh, it had come a long way. In 1932, Roddy Burdine, a Miami pioneer and a huge sports enthusiast with the Greater Miami Athletic Association, decided that sports tourism was a very real solution to depression economics. It was then that the Palm Festival was born, featuring a football game with their slogan being, have a green Christmas in Miami. Ernie Seiler, the city of Miami's recreation director, believed there was a slight hiccup in the plan because even though the University of Miami's football team was willing, they were also poor. The University of Miami, which was to represent the community in the festival, was broke. The school went broke in 32 or 33 during the Depression. So then they had to kind of start over. And the first game Miami played in was, it was in one of the Orange Bowl games. And uh, they had 16 players, but they only had 12 pairs of shoes. So they had to came off the when they came off the field. They had to quickly uh, change shoes and get somebody back on on the field. Seiler and Burdine now needed a team to play the university. George Hussey, chairman of the Greater Miami Athletic Club, called his friend Chick Meehan, coach of the Manhattan College team, which was one of the powerhouse teams of the East. The festival committee guaranteed Manhattan $3,000 to appear. A dollar amount that size during the middle of the Depression was a lot of money. Meehan brought his team in by ocean liner, 
and on arrival demanded the rest of the money, but Seiler and company didn't have it. With only days left till kickoff, they needed to find the cash fast. So they made Miami's chief of police their finance chairman. With creative financing in mind, the chief went around to all the prominent bookies in town for the cash. Even the notorious A.C. Ducey, a powerful Miami crime figure of the time, contributed to the amount just before the game. Meehan accepted the money and joked he would hold the score to only three touchdowns. The first game kicked off on New Year's Eve in 1933. The location was Moore Park and the wooden bleachers held only 1,300 people. During the halftime ceremonies, the first queen, Marguerite Sweet, was brought onto the field encased in a bag of transparent material. She had almost been smothered to unconsciousness due to someone having forgotten to open the air vents on the bubble. Aside from the small hiccups in the halftime show, the Palm Festival was a success. And to top it all off, the University of Miami football team, a 21-point underdog, upset Manhattan College 7-0. The City Fathers celebrated their first bowl game and began planning for the next one immediately. Two years later in 1935, the game's name was changed to the Orange Bowl game, and the location was moved closer to downtown. The momentum had begun, and Pride now demanded a permanent home for the Orange Bowl. Seiler and Burdine once again rallied support from civic leaders and the community at large. The City of Miami and the Greater Miami Athletic Association reached an agreement to build a new stadium on a city park called Tatum Field. But they needed the funds first. WPA then was loaning money to build sidewalks and parks and recreation areas. And it just so happened that uh, one of the gentlemen who worked for the WPA was a fraternity brother of my dad's from Oklahoma A&M. And it, he, after he got talking and they found out that the head of the WPA went to uh, Georgetown. And so uh, they got to talking to him and they said, uh, well, we know you played at Georgetown and we'd love to have Georgetown come down and play. And in fact, why don't you come down and officiate our first game? So they invited him down for the be officiate for the first Orange Bowl game. And they paid $325,000 to start the Orange Bowl and they built a stadium where it is right now, which sat about 18,000 people. In the spring of 1937, as construction was underway, the Orange Bowl Committee was formed and the selection of its officers finalized. The original intent uh, was to uh, promote the weather and the people and the fun and the recreation at a time when people were snowed in. $325,000 later, the new concrete and steel stadium stood near the downtown area. But sadness also tinged the completion because Roddy Burdine died only two months before it was finished. The local businessman, who had been one of the stadium's champions, never saw it completed. Seiler would miss his friend, but he would not let his name be forgotten. The stadium, that would eventually bear the name of the Orange Bowl, was called the Burdine Stadium after one of its champions. The Orange Bowl was dedicated in its first year of existence in December of 1938 during the University of Miami Georgia football game. And it was dedicated to Roddy Burdine, a great sportsman, civic activist, a business uh, genius who had passed away in 1936. And so it was called Roddy Burdine Stadium. And for the first dozen years, until the city commission changed its name to the Orange Bowl in 1950, we knew it as Burdine Stadium or Roddy Burdine Stadium. In 1938, the new stadium welcomed its first Orange Bowl game. Auburn edged Michigan State that year, 6-0. The halftime show featured 13 school bands and drill teams from all over South Florida, with a total of 1,100 marchers and musicians on the field. Even though the stadium could accommodate 23,000, less than 19,000 showed up for the game. But 1939 found the city of Miami adding an additional 5,000 seats as the popularity of the game had finally caught on. The Orange Bowl game had Tennessee squaring off against Oklahoma, and it was played to a sellout crowd for the first time in the stadium. The massive crowds didn't happen by chance because the shrewd marketing strategy of Ernie Seiler played a hand in it. 
Seiler visited the Oklahoma campus and convinced the unbeaten team to play with half the money they were offered by the Sugar and Cotton Bowls. Of course, he did this by sneaking around the campus in the middle of the night and writing, On to Miami! in chalk on the sidewalks. Seiler, also a big believer in visual aids, gave an on-campus lecture featuring huge posters of girls reclining on the sands of Miami Beach in the smallest possible bathing suits the era would allow. Jimmy Burns, the sports writer, always nicknamed him the Mad Genius because he always uh, put on the halftime shows and did the parades and he was actually the promoter for the Orange Bowl. And after every game he would go back to the office in January, sit down and would lay out a whole plan for the next halftime show and exactly what he wanted to do. We're going forward year after year to make each one better than the year before. So look out, Orange Bowl, here we come. In 1941, the pageantry of the Orange Bowl festivities continued to grow. As America was coming to grips with wars on two fronts, the King Orange Jamboree Parade expanded to 70 floats and 33 bands. Walter Winchell wrote, after viewing the halftime show featuring some of the parade floats, the rainbow spectacles between halves makes everything else in show business seem small time. You sit in the stands and all of a sudden at halftime, a crazy Ernie Sire would spray orange perfume all over the audience. Well, you couldn't, you couldn't lie about where you were at. You smell like orange perfume for, for days after. They had a truck that went around the Orange Bowl I'm listening to the orange blossom smell. So you'd sit in the orange bowl and you had these confetti coming down, the smell, Queen's props opening, uh, music playing, band. So many times we had singers, and there, they whole, there the whole show started. It was really a fantastic festival. It was just magic, uh, particularly as a little child, and Miami wasn't nearly as sophisticated to see what Ernie Seiler was gonna do next. Everybody said, where's the queen, where's the queen? And they bring in these big floats and you're, you're scanning the floats and out of one of the floats would emerge the Orange Bowl queen. 